Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here, and welcome to the 2018 Symposium. Uh, I'm Kim Savarino. I'm the co-chair of Dance NYC's Junior Committee, and I'll be your MC in the theater today. Uh, we have just a few logistical notes before we begin. So first, as you can tell, the theater is very full this morning. To accommodate overflow, we are simulcasting these first sessions in Studio C and in Studio Y. Uh, second, please note that in case of emergency, there are fire exits. Uh, check out where the nearest ones are to you. Third, you are being photographed and filmed this morning as part of the symposium. Uh, if you wish not to be captured, the no photography area of every room is going to be in the back row. Um, and fourth, we encourage you to use the symposium app. This, you can submit questions, you can connect with other event attendees, uh, and you can also find the program and schedule just on an online record. You can use the app to send speakers questions at all of today's sessions as well. So if you haven't already done so, if you download Hello Crowd through your app store on your phone um, and select Dance NYC 2018 Symposium, you'll have access. And finally, we hope that you'll keep the conversations going both in person and online. Tag us on Twitter and Facebook and use the hashtag DanceSymp. Uh, if there's anything we can do to make your experience more comfortable, there are Dance NYC staff and volunteers stationed throughout each room. Uh, you can find them wearing the black I am a New Yorker for dance t-shirts. So with that, I am pleased to introduce Dance NYC's board chair, uh, Alyssa Hecker. Good morning, New Yorkers for dance. This is very exciting to have you here. Welcome, as she just said, to the Dance NYC 2018 Symposium. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alyssa Hecker. I am the chair of the board of directors of this phenomenal organization, and we're so happy to have everyone here today. Here, we're at 280 Broadway. This is home of Gibney Dance and its six new amazing studios. So, shout out to Gina. This is a wonderful place. For those of you who may be new to Dance NYC and our work, this is the only annual full day gathering of the dance field in the New York metropolitan area. It's a cornerstone of Dance NYC's leadership training, networking, and convening portfolio. Dance NYC offers four core services for the field, action-oriented research, leadership training, promotion, and investment to empower dance makers and educators, create audiences, and strengthen the collective voice of the art form. Created as an independent nonprofit in 2013, we work, with a, with a, bleh, we work in alliance with Dance at USA, a national organization to drive local national synergies in dance service delivery. You can learn more about our programs at dance.nyc. There's an amazingly strong team behind all of Dance NYC's work and the event today. I thank my fellow board directors and advisors, especially Gina Givney, our board member, for hosting this massive and important event. I thank especially our Symposium Programming Committee and all of the volunteers wearing those awesome shirts which are for sale out front. It's good to advertise. Um, I thank Executive Director Lane Har Harwell, a true force of nature, yes. which is, and the entire wonderful Dance NYC staff and volunteers for their work behind the scenes, especially Program Manager Alejandra Duxifuentes, without whom this craziness would not occur. And of course, I want to thank all of you for being with us, uh, virtually or in this room. Please join me now in thanking the leadership supporters who have made this symposium possible. We have the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, which is supporting our work to reveal and address inequities that exist in professional dance. Yes. We have the Howard Gilman Foundation. The National Endowment for the Arts, which must remain fully funded and vibrant. The New York State Council on the Arts. The New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Con Edison, our lead corporate sponsor. We have Paul Galando, our lead technology sponsor. The Arnhold Foundation. Jody is a huge proponent of 
Proskauer Rose, LLP. Uh, Nell Shelbridge Productions, which is documenting and editing sessions, as well as streaming the day's keynotes through Facebook Live. Nell Shelby specializes in filming dance beautifully. And Christopher Duggan Photography. Chris has volunteered to photograph the symposium since its inaugural year. Chris is a highly respected dance and wedding photographer. We have Eat Off Beat, which offers authentic off-the-beaten-path dishes by refugees who now call New York City home. That's a huge. And of course, many not-for-profit and educational partners. Now I'm pleased to introduce Alton Murray, who's over here. Uh, Strategic Partnership Manager at Con Edison, who's here to offer a few remarks on behalf of our lead corporate sponsor, and soak up everything today and enjoy the symposium and make great connections. Um, greetings. I bring you greetings from the 15,000 Con Edison employees. It's um, great to be here. Con Edison supports about 150 arts organizations. Um, the purpose of our goals is to be in every community. We primarily support arts education. Um, we try to work with organizations who are in the schools, who are doing work to promote and create future diverse audience. It's very, very important to us to, you know, to promote the cultural community in New York because it's such a fiber, in the fiber of this city. We are very, very happy to be partnering with Dance NYC. This is our second year as a lead sponsor of this program. And it's different than anything that we do, but the work that this organization is doing to create the conversation around inclusion and diversity, it's important to us. And so enjoy the day, and I'm happy to be here, and I look forward to interacting with as many of you as possible. Thank you for being here. Morning. Whoa. Okay. Back down to earth. <laughs> Hi, I'm Gina Gibney, and I am a proud board member of Dance NYC. This is a big year for Dance NYC, the fifth year as an independent nonprofit. And could we be more fortunate in this field, in this city, than to have the leadership of the extraordinary Lane Harwell? Lane, you have transformed this field in such a short time, and we're just so proud and grateful for all you've done. Uh, it's also a big year for Gibney Dance, which is now Gibney. I don't know. <laughs> we rebranded. <laughs> or we're going to rebrand. It's OK. It, it happens. Uh, but we are so delighted to host the symposium and share our new spaces with you. Last night, we launched six new studios. <laughs> it happened. <laughs> Just a year ago, we were threatening to launch six new studios. But with the support of the Department of Cultural Affairs, the Howard Gilman Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, Mertz Gilmore, Sea Change, we made it happen. But for us, this is really about a lot more than space. It's not about real estate. It's not about saying, now we have six more studios. It's really about the future of this field and how we can make those spaces accessible, affordable, and available to our field. And it's not just about serving artists. You know, we talk a lot in this field about more space to serve artists. Well, why is that important? <laughs> it's important because the work that we do matters and it has thrived without support. So imagine if we could support that work more fully and we could bring those voices to a receptive audience. We can change hearts, we can change minds, and we can really make a difference in this world, and that's why all of this matters. So thank you for being part of this incredible journey to today. Uh, the next phase for us is really about partnership and incubation. And I'm going to give you just a few hints of things to come. Uh, first of all, I am so proud to announce our partnership with the Joyce Theater. Linda Shelton is here today. Thank you, Linda. <clears throat> a year ago, Linda heard me say I needed help. And she 
uh, raised her hand and came forward. And for the next three years, the Joyce Theater, with support from Mertz, Mellon, and Gilman, names you are going to hear often today, is opening a permanent residency space in our Studio W. It's a gorgeous space, and it's going to be full of activity, uh, and it's going to create a real centerpiece to the new space. So thank you, Linda. Uh, we also are thrilled that one of the spaces, Studio Y, is going to be a production residency space. And I don't need to tell anybody in this room how that can elevate our field. And I'm thrilled that the Mellon-supported Dance and Process program is not only going to find a home in Studio Y, but it's going to add this year two production residencies, immersive production residencies for a total of 12 supported by the Mellon Foundation. So thank you, Ella. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Hannah. We're so concerned about emerging artists, and we're working on a plan to make Studio X the emerging artist space. And as a preview of things to come, we have support from the SHS Foundation to launch a new flexible emerging artist initiative, Making Space Plus. Stay tuned for more on that. And finally, I was thrilled to learn yesterday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, what board meets on a Saturday, but the Bay and Paul Foundation met and they have pooled their resources to help us launch a new incubation mechanism moving toward justice, a new program that is going to pool a lot of our resources, a lot of our capability, a lot of the capability of the field, and help people launch new projects. You know, our field is full of great ideas. How do we realize those? How do we put them out into the world? Because the world needs what we have right about now. The support I have personally received from the dance community in the last years has been phenomenal, and I thank everyone in this room. You've been extraordinary. I'm now very proud to re uh, introduce Juan Jose Escalante from the uh, Jose Limon Dance Company, and also Alejandra Duque Cuentas, the program manager and the person that programmed and produced this entire e wow. evening. No. Day. Day. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Back up again. Thank you, Gina, for hosting all, us and for all you do to make um, space for dance in New York City. My name is Juan Jose Escalante. I'm the executive director of the Jose Limon Dance Foundation. But I'm here this morning wearing two different hats. First, as a proud new member of the Dance NYC Board of Directors. And second, oh, please, wait until you see me dance. Um, and second, as a member of the inaugural Symposium Programming Committee created to advise and assist the Dance NYC staff in bringing today's symposium to life. This is Alejandra Lucas y Fuentes. Uh, programs Manager for Dance NYC, and we're pleased to offer some context for our discussions today and to introduce our first speakers. I'd like to thank Alejandra and all the members of the, um, of the co uh, committee that planned uh, for today's event uh, for the leadership and the hard work creating uh, all the programming for today. Thank you, Juan Jose. Good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to see this room full of faces when before it was just chairs. Um, so I'll, I'll give you some context on how we put today's uh, event together. The work of the committee and of the participants today is to consider the role of New York dance artists and creativity in a changing United States as the field responds to the priorities of a new presidential administration. So we are in place and in time. The programming reflects Dance NYC's current priorities and commitments to revealing, removing, and preventing inequities that exist in professional dance, and invites all of us here as a community to deep dive into burning issues, from anti-racism and climate change to trans rights and education. It is our desire to continue to think critically and intentionally on the areas of civic and social life that intersect our needs and desires as an artistic community. Emboldened with the tools of artistry, advocacy, and collaboration, we seek to continue to build a more equitable dance ecology. Absolutely. In this work, Dance NYC is responding boldly to the shifting political uh, and funding climate. 
Over this past year, we have worked to acknowledge and address long-standing issues of sexual harassment and abuses of power in the dance field. We have expanded our commitment to small budget dance makers by providing multi-year general support to 25 local groups with thanks uh, to the general support of the Ford Foundation and also by publishing two policy reports focused on fiscally sponsored dance audits and projects which we are uh, which were developed in partnership with nine local fiscal uh, sponsors and made possible with the support of the New York Community Trust. Thank you. Working closely with our dedicated partners, we have continued to deepen our work to increase equity, inclusion, and diversity uh, in the field with a sharp focus on increasing race and disability equity. We have encouraged all of our speakers uh, in every session today to explicitly address these focal points, and we're also offering a five-part Voices in Race and Dance discussion track to address racism in the field. As we hope you can tell in all aspects of the day, from our communications to our use of accessible, of the, the, uh, the use of the accessible entrance at the uh, 280 Broadway, we have endeavored to ensure equity. We want to hear from you uh, throughout the day and we'll invite you your, your feedback um, in service following every event. Today is also a really special day um, because Dance NYC is launching a new initiative to extend the role of artistry in fostering the inclusion, integration, and human rights of more than three million immigrant New Yorkers in the metropolitan area while shaping urgent public discussions about immigrant affairs. As a part of this Immigrant Artists Initiative, Dance NYC unveils early research, New York City's foreign-born dance workforce demographics, which is the subject of an afternoon session and included in all of your gift bags. We have also made online resources available on the Dance NYC website and are pleased to announce a free day-long Immigrant Artists Conference on Friday, September 21st, 2018, to be hosted at the Queens Theater in the Park and presented in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. A special thanks to Terrence Sacramore, who could not be here today, um, from the Queens Theater for welcoming us in. Thank you, Terrence, if you're watching us online. Seed leadership support for this initiative has been provided by the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, uh, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. The planned work developed co in collaboration with a 14-person task force of immigrant artists, educators, and advocates is iterative and sets the stage for additional action over time. Please save the date for September 21st for the Immigrant Artist Conference. And I know we're about to start the discussion for the 2018 symposium but we are pleased to announce that the Dance NYC 2019 symposium is already scheduled for Saturday, February 24th, 2019 at Hunter College. Saturday, yes, thank you. February 23rd. You have 24. <laughs> we are offering an, an exclusive rate for this year's symposium's attendees to register early this week, so please visit our website, dance.nyc, <laughs> to take advantage of this special offer. Now, we're very excited to introduce our first session, an armchair discussion on the role of government uh, support for the arts one year into a new presidential administration. With, we have with us uh, leaders of the National Arts Advocacy Organizations, Robert L. Lynch, President and CEO of Americans for the Arts, and Michelle Ramos, uh, Executive Director of Alternate Roots and Chair of the Board of Dance USA, the National Service Organization for Professional Dance with which Dance NYC works in alliance. This session will be moderated by Dance NYC's Executive Director, Lane Harwell, and we are simulcasting the session and streaming it via Facebook Live. Thank you so much for coming and enjoy the day. Thank you. Good morning to those of you in the room with us, to those who are watching via simulcast and on Facebook Live, and welcome Michelle and Bob. Hello. 
Oh, welcome. <laughs> Great. Oh. Say hi to the Facebook Live crowd. Hi, Facebook hi, crowd. Live. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm hoping to accomplish in our conversation this morning is first to provide some context for our symposium theme. Dance and creativity in a changing United States one year into the Trump administration by interrogating the role of government in supporting the arts now. Second, I'm hoping that we can all leave with some takeaways, ways to engage in arts advocacy now, and I have at least one action I'll suggest later. Uh, I've prepared a, a few questions just to get us started, but we'll save time for a Q&A. We want this to be dynamic, and we'll take questions both from those of you in the room and those of you who are watching via sim simulcast and Facebook Live. You can put your questions, for those who aren't with us in the room, you can put your questions on the Symposium app or on the Facebook Live feed, and we'll try to get to those questions. Shall we, shall we dive in? Yep, let's dive? <laughs> okay. There's a dance move. There you go. <laughs> so let's talk government support of the arts. We have an administration that has threatened the rights of creativity and free expression, proposed the elimination of our federal cultural agencies, and pushed forward a tax plan that, among its harms, is a disincentive to charitable giving. So. <laughs> much sums it up. <laughs> that, that's, that's just a regular day in Washington. <laughs> so from your perspective as national advocates, what are the biggest challenges and opportunities in advancing government support for the arts now? What can we be hopeful about? Michelle? Um, so what I'm about to say might be shocking to folks, but frankly, in the world that I sit in and the arts organizations that I'm a part of and that I lead, the Trump appointment has actually been an opportunity because what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing from my um, constituency, from my members, is it is inciting so much passion and so much pushback and so much anger amongst folks in the arts community and spe specifically in the dance community that funders, and again, stepping away from the government funders just momentarily, individual funders who are passionate about issues of immigration and equity are just sinking funds into the organizations that I represent um, who have been doing this work for decades um, because they, they need a place to be able to say, we have to fight, we have to fight. And they recognize that you know, the political landscape is just a nightmare and so they're looking around for ways that they can contribute support and impact on these issues, and artists are reaping the benefits of this in ways that I haven't seen in decades. So yes, there's a lot of negativity, but there's so much opportunity around this, and I think as artists, if we can leverage that, it's, it's, it's just gonna make a, an incredible difference in our world. Additionally, artists, in my estimation, are the best advocates that we have. If you take um, the shooting of you know, the, the past two weeks, it's a horrific situation. But that, those leaders, those young student leaders, the ones that got the millions of dollars of funding from Oprah and all these other organizations, like the most funding ever, they were all in the drama club. Where do you, they, where do you think they learned to be empowered, to fight, to ha have um, autonomy of voice? It was the arts, and the arts and their arts background is what is empowering them to really step forward in this. And so because the world's in the state it is, the opportunity for the arts is huge. Yes, there's challenges around the tax law. Yes, there's challenges around the NEA, but there's so much opportunity, and I think it's so important that we keep focused on that. Thank you, thank you Michelle. And Bob. Well, first, and, thank you for having this uh, symposium, and the congratulations on the great numbers. <coughs> it's thank fabulous. You. Um, what, uh, thank you all. Absolutely. Um, and I, I feel most comfortable wherever I go these days uh, with a pile of policy on my lap, so I hope you'll uh, you'll. Uh, He's brought the that. slides. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, because of the, of the actual specifics that you were asking about what has happened, I do have some slides. Uh, and the first one uh, that, whoops, if, if the clicker clicked, um, the first slide after this one, 
um, if somebody could advance it, is just simply, I want to thank the artists, the dancers, who have helped with this cause, who have helped over many years. But just as an example here, um, on our artist committee, there are people like Justin Peck, for example, David Hallberg, and, and, and many, many others. On, on the board, people like Liz Lerman, uh, Brian Stokes Mitchell. Um, you see little Buck up there uh, working with uh, Captain Moira McGuire as they went to the Hill to make a case. Um, you know, uh, Bill T, who's gonna be here later, uh, Brishnikov, and, um, up there uh, at the top, on the left, some of you may recognize Diane Brace, who used to be the um, uh, deputy director of Dance USA, but has been my partner in life for the last 25 years. So I get dance at home, day and night. Uh, <laughs> More than you ever want. Yeah. Um, the second, the slide after this one um, is what, what's on the table. And even though we're largely talking about the new presidency, what's on the table is federal, state, and local government money. Um, and that shows at the top the local government money, um, about a billion dollars of that local government money, which is actually more like three or four billion dollars. The middle slide shows the state government money, which is around 400 uh, million. And the bottom one is the federal NEA money, 150 million. Now what's interesting about that, though, is that the real problem is the importance, the absolute importance of the NEA, because it, over the years, has leveraged all the other money. In my opinion, the NEA itself, 150 million, still the single biggest funding source for the arts, is uh, the money itself is not as important as what it leverages. And this is just the government uh, piece of it there. So um, when we look at the federal issue in the next slide, you see that um, uh, with government, um, one more slide to advance. Um, there are a lot of things on the table. Appropriations, which is what the 150 million is, um, is only the National Endowment for the Arts appropriations. And I'm going to, uh, when the next slide comes up, uh, talk a little Can bit. Can we get the next slide? Um, about um, the fact that uh, congressional appropriations, besides the NEA, is about a billion dollars. A billion dollars. Now, let's take a look at that in a second. The tax money on the table is about $18 billion, um, with the tax incentive driving it. We'll talk about that later, I think. And then there are things out there, like the CREATE Act, the third thing that I have there, that is specifically designed to create more opportunity for individual artists. Um, and so with the next slide after this one, this is just quickly to show you what happened. Um, if we could advance, uh, that's the billion dollars. Um, above the red line. That's a billion dollars that has been appropriated for the arts in America. Only at the top is the NEA, but you've got the NEH, the museums, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, all the way down to that red line. And then below that is the Smithsonian, the Holocaust Memorial, all of these other kinds of institutions. That's another billion. So what you're looking at there is two billion dollars. Now, here's an interesting thing for you to think about. Everything above the red line, which gets distributed out across America, was zeroed out last year by the administration. And everything below the red line, which is in Washington, D.C., the capital city, is, was retained. Okay, so there's a ph philosophy right there that you have to think about. Now, if you go to the next slide, um, uh, what I wanna show here is simply above that red line. At the beginning of the year, a year ago, uh, all of those agencies which fund the arts and, and this a bit of dance funded in every one of those areas. All of those agencies had a billion dollars. You see it there. They were all slated for termination. We fought with you, with those dancers on the first slide, to get all the money back. And we got all the money back, almost all the money back, in the House of Representatives, and all the money back in the Senate. And even though the process is not finished, it's going to be that amount for this year. So congratulations to you for that. And then my last slide um, that uh, uh, we will be looking at here in this part of the conversation as it comes up, drama. Next, sli next slide. Next slide shows uh, what happened last week. The president and the administration uh, zeroed everything out again. Everything's been zeroed out again. Now what's important though is to not be, uh, not be depressed about that, to be joyous about that, that you won. You have the power and we can do even more. Um, but, but we cannot get complacent, that battle is still ahead. So be joyful. Be joyful, <laughs> be vigilant, and take action.
And, and there's, frankly, just a, quite a bit of bipartisan support, right? So I know oftentimes we feel like it's us and them, but what we have to recognize is there is like incredibly strong bipartisan support to make sure that this doesn't happen. So also take a little stock in that as well and positivity. Absolutely, thank you. And, and thank you, uh, Bob, for inundating us with these data, these data points on, feder on federal support for the arts. Um, very helpful context. Um, can we talk a bit about the tax plan? Sure. What do, what do you think's going on there? How's that gonna impact our, our sector and thoughts? Go ahead. Um, so I like what I think that uh, is important with the tax plan is to, to realize is that there's two entirely different philosophies looking at the tax plan. If, if you look at the amount of money that comes from private sector giving to the nonprofit arts in America, individuals, foundations, corporations, um, that private sector giving is, our estimate, is about $18 billion. That's a lot of money. And the question is, how much of that is driven by uh, tax deductions that shoot that money forward? Um, the, the, the progressive side, the democratic side, feels that it is hugely driven by um, those incentives and feels that um, w we possibly could lose $13 billion in the nonprofit sector from disincentives of the tax law being changed to limit, the change was to limit the number of people who itemize. Um, the, the Republican side feels that there's gonna be so much more money coming into the economy that people are going to be giving more just because they have more. They, they discount that the, um, that the uh, tax incentive has as much of a, uh, or itemizing has as much of an incentive. Now, you have to ask yourself, if that's the case, why is there so much giving uh, in December, just before January 1st? You know, there's a reason that that happens. And so I tend to believe the $13 billion loss side of things. But we won't know the full answer to this until um, 2019 because it's being implemented this year. So one of the things we're trying to do is to study indicators throughout this com coming year um, that can help us get a pretty good handle so we can have good arguments in order to, whichever way it leads us, um, lobby for a, a better taxes, uh, tax incentives that benefit the arts. Thank you. Michelle? Sure, I think, so thank you for that. That's all really great information and good to know, but I think oftentimes, we have to look at things from the artist's perspective, like how is this impacting the individual artists? And so while we are in a wait and see pattern with this, because we really won't know the impact of these, ta uh, the, the implication of the tax shifts but until well into 2019, again, I, I feel like I'm just Miss Positivity this morning, but there is so much good that we can kind of hang our hat on. Um, the peace provision, which had basically limited all deductions for high income taxpayers was repealed. Um, the IRA charitable rollover that Dance USA and other nonprofits lobbied really hard for remained untouched. Um, and then on the education side, which I know a lot of you, like me, have student loans, and there's that whole thing. Um, but the, the educational provisions, like student loan, interest deduction, tax-free tuition waivers and reimbursements, and employer-provided education assistance remained untouched. So individually, as artists, those are the things that really hit home with us, and those are things that, you know, not making any promises moving forward, but those things stayed intact, and that's good for the individual artist. Thank you for that, and I don't mean to be entirely negative here, <laughs> but I think I just want to put on the table as well the question of who may experience the disincentive to charitable giving, and it would appear to me that it is those who earn less than major patrons, and that, there's, and that there are clear questions that we need to be asking about class, about race, about who is benefiting from the services and who is, and who is controlling the services through their resources. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have thoughts sure. there. I mean, I think that you, know, you can't have a conversation around these issues without talking about uh, impact and socioeconomics and race. Those are just hand-in-hand -hand conversations. It's interesting because <clears throat> I'm just gonna go on, off on a little rant for a moment, but go for the, it. The, the artists that I uh, work with, and putting on my alternate roots hat for the moment, 
you know, they are um, artists that are living in the South. They are artists that, by and large, are not being funded by the NEA. However, there's always, always the trickle-down effect, right? Like, the NEA funds the local organizations, those uh, local state regrant to the smaller organizations. But by and large, the majority of the artists that I work with have no stake in NEA funding. But that said, I do think that there is a responsibility for what we're messaging about the value of the arts, you know? And so even if you're an artist that doesn't get funding from the NEA, it's so important to understand that your voice matters because if we're messaging as a country that the arts and our historical culture and legacy just simply doesn't matter or that it's not important, then it is impacting you, whether or not you get those dollars or not. Um, you know, the dance field overarchingly is probably more significantly impacted than our, you know, our symphony, opera, the theater partners, uh, just because we're simply in that lower income bracket. And then you look at the larger, broader dance field, and it's the very smallest companies that potentially could have the biggest harms. But again, the question becomes, you know, does that, um, that, does that passion, does that frustration with what's going on, is that an opportunity for us to leverage funding from our individual donors? Um, how, do we, how do we harness the, the opportunity and that, yeah. and that there, seems, there seems to be one? I, mean, I want to drill a little bit deeper into the, the topic you just brought up, which is disciplined specificity mm -hmm. right, in, in this work. So how is the landscape of government support for the arts impacting dance in ways that are unique compared to its peer disciplines, Well, uh, if, if it is. I would, I would um, I'll defer to the dance expert in a second, but what I would say is that. Your wife. Um, yes. yes. <laughs> and boss. Probably watching. Um, size is a, a significant um, situation in this case. And uh, what's going to happen is that a lot of the smaller and mid-sized organizations I feel are going to uh, be hurt, particularly with the tax side of the, um, the issue. Why is that? Well, a third of the American public had the ability to itemize. Not everybody gives money because of the tax deduction, but a third had the ability to itemize, and now it's gonna be more like 5%, maybe 10% have the ability to itemize. That means it's going to be richer people, and where do they give the money? Well, largely to bigger institutions and in bigger cities. That's where that, that money goes. Um, and that means that uh, th there could be a significant lessening below. So it's an interesting phenomenon. It could mean that at the end of this year, you look and it actually has been more money given um, uh, uh, as donations to the arts. It could be because of this law, but it could also be that that more is lopsided to the big and the rich, and that's the big danger that I feel. And, and, in, and in dance, dance Dances. being small, smaller yes. organizations, comparatively, yeah. it might experience a, a, a worse impact than, 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 the, than other disciplines. And then also within the field, thinking about the range of organizational budget right. size and those who, within dance, may be more adversely impacted than, than others. Absolutely. So, Michelle, do right. you have thoughts? Well, about? I mean, you know, if you're, I mean, if you're talking about sort of scale, um, and in the specific to the dance, you know, community, then you know, unquestionably, the impact and the harms are going to be more um, painful for those organizations that are, for lack of a better word, and I don't mean this in the way that it sounds, but at the bottom of the food chain, the folks that have been begging for scraps all along, the organizations of color, or the organizations that are are based in the South, like they already have the battle that they, you know, like dealt with, they've had to deal with that. And now you add to that equation that what little um, funding they were able to secure is going to be taken away. Well, those are gonna be the first organizations that are gonna feel the harm, have the impact, and where the fallout needs to be. Um, or not needs to be, but where the fallout will be. And so that, um, to me, also is really important for those larger institutions and orga organizations to have on their radar, right? Um, you know, a very large ballet company is going to have some impact, but will it completely make them close their doors? No. But for some of the artists that I work with in Alternate Roots, 
you know, one little small piece of funding that we consider negligible or not important might in fact be the thing that tips them over the edge and makes them not be able to continue to do their work. So I, I, I appreciate that and, and I would just, I would offer that Dance NYC's research has shown that the larger organizations have gotten larger over recent time and the smaller organizations have lost revenue from multiple, from multiple sources. And it's also the case that these are very adaptable organizations. They're more racially diverse, more likely to include disabled artists than larger organizations, and that there seems to be a real inequity that already exists in the, in the distribution of resources that might be exacerbated by a shift like this. Um, we've raised some of the issues, um, some of the issues. <laughs> Uh, but I want to hear more about your work uh, and what your organizations, Michelle, Alternate Roots, and Dance USA, and Bob, Americans for the Arts, what are your organizations doing to advance government support for the arts now, and what's, what's new and what's working? Michelle? Um, so, you know, Dance USA, as most of you know, is, is based in Washington, D.C. We were you know, like placed there for that purpose, to be at the front door of the government, the federal government, the NEA. Um, we have a, a lobbyist on staff. We are constantly like advocating, doing this work. If you are not um, uh, subscribed to our email list, you should be, uh, because we are constantly, you know, fighting uh, not just with this whole NEA situation, but across so many other spectrums: taxes, visas for artists, immigration. Um, all of this is, is stuff that uh, Dance USA is, is constantly uh, working on on the ground in DC and um, is an, an incredible resource for artists and for dance artists to seek out um, when you, you know, decide that yes, it is time for me to take up and be an advocate and, and work hard on this. Um, you know, Alternate Roots is a very different organization, right? It's a 42-year-old organization that was uh, based in the South and represents um, the, some of the most forgotten artists, dance and other art forms um, in the country. And that's simply just due to geographic location. Um, that said, the artists in that organization are some of the most, as you stated, resilient, smart, um, talented, and insightful artists uh, that I have had the, the pleasure of working with. And they sit at the intersection of arts and social justice. So for where we are right now, and the opportunity for those artists is really fantastic. Um, it's a really great time because people are paying attention. Um, the thing though that makes me sad in my heart is these artists have been doing this work since the organization was founded. But now that people are paying attention to these issues, now all of a sudden it, we become the flavor of the month, so to speak. Um, and so I would say um, that I think that with both of the hats that I wear, there's uh, advocacy that's being done, some on the front line, some very high level. But in my estimation, the artists that are, that are you know, on the ground, closer to the work, closer to you know, the realities of their communities, those are the ones that really um, are making a significant impact and change, much like the, the drama students in the shooting this past week in Florida. Thank you for that. And, and Bob, uh, Americans for the Arts. Great. Well, I, I, I knew you were going to ask this question, so I brought a couple of slides that I thought were. Did uh, you now? <laughs> but if, what, 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 what I want to say um, is that we are in a very um, explosively um, both bad and opportune time, and to your point uh, earlier. And this particular wheel that I have up here represents. 33 different aspects of community and how the arts intersect, or, or, or illustrating that the arts could intersect with these different aspects of community. And what I would say, and, and Alternate Roots is a pioneer of this kind of work, but the, the idea that there could be arts and um, military work up at the top left-hand side, or arts and education work, or arts and um, uh, business and tourism and economic work on the left-hand side, that is where a lot of the advancement of money for the arts in government is coming right now. I'll just give you an example of the military one at the top. Um, you saw a slide earlier that showed Captain Moira McGuire um, with Lil Buck. Um, and uh, $2 million of the $150 million that the NEA budget 
um, uh, had last year and the year before, this year and, and last year, is for military arts work. And the military arts, arts and healing work was one of the things that brought the Republicans on board uh, to uh, be supportive of the entire budget. So this particular slide illustrates that as a direction that I think we all have to pay uh, attention to. Next slide um, that uh, is there is just simply the advocacy work itself. And our work um, has a, a, a four or five different thrusts. So there is a people mobilization piece. This slide illustrates that. And all the different kinds of people, artists that you see there, um, uh, the head of the United States Conference of Mayors, the head of the conference board, all of the business people, the gentleman with the white hair uh, on, on, in, in, the, in the left there. And on the right, the Republican leader, now gone, and the Democratic leader of the Appropriations Committee. That's the package that you want that gets us moving forward. This I call the $100 million uh, picture because uh, at the table where we brought these people were two years of NEA and NEH funding um, and uh, uh, and also the, the whole package um, of the jobs bill. Now, people mobilization is one. Communication, a communication strategy is two. I'll illustrate that in a second. Case making data is three. What do they care to hear about? Not what do you want to say. What do they, the people you're trying to convince, care to hear about? Um, localization, as opposed to just national. Uh, unexpected voices. And finally, uh, we do a lot of um, C4 work. Uh, which is a political organization that allows us to get involved in electoral politics. So with that, the next slide, and I'll go very quickly, whoops, too quickly. Um, this slide here illustrates the communications piece there on the left, bringing people together, and you see some dance folks there like Brian Stokes Mitchell um, at the table, um, and um, voices, young people. This is a young, a, a young girl from New Jersey um, talking about the arts, talking about it to her New Jersey legislature legislator in New Jersey. The next slide that you um, see illustrates the um, uh, one tool of the data tools that I was talking about. Now, you don't, can't really see that one very well, but we have worked with Dun & Bradstreet um, to uh, get a list of 700,000 for-profit and non-profit arts organizations, many of them dance organizations, in America, and then we married it to mapping technology so that we can pull out a map in any zip code in America. This is where you are right now, Manhattan. And so if I was uh, sitting down with Jerry Nadler, um, uh, Congressman Jerry Nadler, I could show him that there's 15,620 businesses here employing 219,000 people in his district. Um, the next slide shows another bit of data, uh, economic impact. Now, here's an interesting thing. If I ask most artists uh, about uh, what's the most important motivator for um, uh, the value of the arts, economic impact would be at the bottom of the list. It's the inherent value. But if I ask any legislator, federal, state, or heads. local, <laughs> federal, state, or local, economic impact is always at the top of the list. So if they, if they want that information, we research it and provide the data so that we can make a broad case, starting always with the inherent value and then moving to the more practical. Uh, next slide uh, that is there is the ad campaign itself. Um, and it in integrates the data, but the, the key thing about this, this particular one was part of a federal ad campaign in all the federal newspapers, but the real key thing was we put full page ads in every one of the 50 appropriators, um, the uh, House and Senate appropriators, the people who actually make the decision about the money, and that really paid off with local data as well. And then the final slide, I think, I have one more, um, is, uh, is the slide that would say, uh, actually, there's two more slides. So this slide shows the value of artists' voices like Julie Andrews, Josh Groban, Ben Folds, Cal Penn, and also Lin-Manuel Miranda, all who came up to the, the hill. And, and they made a video which got millions and millions of hits, aimed mostly at the general public. But the key for me is my audience is 500 people, 100 senators, and 400 legislators, Congress people. That's my audience. I want them to see it. And then I want their constituents, their voters, to see it and give them a call. And the last slide here is the C4 work. And the C4 is a different organization. Americans for the Arts is two organizations. Uh, one the more Americans slide. for the Arts Action Fund, uh, the, the second organization, uh, allows us to spend 100% of its money on, um, on uh, pol politics and electoral work. And it also has a PAC 
which allows us to give donations to pro-arts candidates, of which we gave about 120 in the last election. It's free to join that organization to get this information and be able to take immediate action, and that's the website. Thank you, thank you, Bob. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to shift the conversation now to uh, values. Uh, both of you, your organizations, have claimed values of equity, inclusion, and diversity. Uh, as Alternate Roots puts it, it aims to, quote, dismantle all forms of oppression everywhere, end quote. Yes. <laughs> this is a goal I share, Dance NYC shares. Uh, and we'll be exploring throughout its sessions today with an explicit focus on race equity, disability equity, and advancing immigrant artists. Could you both tell me a bit about uh, your organization's equity goals, how you're defining those goals, uh, and how your values are impacting your advocacy? Bob? So, um, uh, so America's City Arts has as its uh, vision statement um, all the arts, in the lives of all of the people. And that vision statement comes from our founding in 1960. Uh, back then, our goals were um, mostly practical. We wanted to create a National Arts Council, so we led the effort to create the National Endowment for the Arts. <clears throat> there were four state arts councils, and we wanted to create the effort to, uh, to create uh, uh, one in every state, and that happened the next year because of a plank that was slipped through in the middle of the night in the legislation that said any state that had a state arts agency could get um, could get matching funds, and, uh, and so 50 state and six territorial arts councils. And then finally, the local arts agencies. There were 100 back then, there's 5,000 now, and that represents that $6 billion. Every one of them has to pay attention to, and we push them to pay attention to, issues of uh, equity. Um, and uh, so way back uh, in, in the uh, early 80s, the first equity uh, statement uh, philosophy that we had was put out. And then the last one, the most recent one, is this statement on cultural equity that came out uh, last year after two years of work. And what it does is primarily says the support of the full creative life for all Americans for the arts commits to, Americans for the arts commits to championing policies and practices that empower a just, inclusive, equitable nation. Now those are words. What do we do about it? Um, the, the idea is that we would look at every aspect of our organization and our member organizations from the point of view of policy, the point of view of program and services, the point of view of board, staff, and uh, advisory bodies, and also uh, a leadership pipeline. So that's what this document says, and we urge others to, to take it up. We then try to measure ourselves. We try to measure ourselves against the face of America. Um, face of America, depending upon what you look at, is um, 30 plus percent, uh, not broad cultural diversity, it's much bigger than that for cultural diversity, which would include age and, rate and uh, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, all of these things, uh, as well as race and ethnicity. But just looking at race and ethnicity as one marker, um, you know, above 30 percent. So we want to be better than that. So our board is 40, almost 40 percent leaders of color. Our staff is 40 percent. Um, our programs are even a, a larger, uh, a real attempt to get uh, uh, leaders and, and, and faces of people in front of the audiences um, as, uh, uh, as something. And we're constantly beating ourselves up about it. We're constantly measuring and, you know, wanting to do better. Um, and, and with that, uh, even things like um, the pipeline, one of the programs that we have um, is something that here in New York you, you, you might know about, um, which is at, at our Arts and Business Council in New York, for 25 years, we've had a, a diversity dial internship program. Um, and uh, this full page ad in Cranes, and I want to uh, thank Alton and Con Ed for supporting this for all these years, um, shows uh, that uh, this year's class is added to 244 uh, students of color over the last 25 years into 112 New York City arts organizations that includes over a dozen dance groups that I have highlighted here, and the highlight has disappeared. Um, but uh, <laughs> they're all here. Not, not that that's a metaphor for dance, no. Uh, it has to, <laughs> dance is forefront. But I mean, so the point is, the point is uh, 
you can talk, you can do, and you need to do, and then you need to measure the do, see if it's enough, and start again. And uh, Bob, you may, you may know this, but and if you're not, you'll be happy to hear, and thank you, Alton, again. Uh, we have a dial intern who became our equity and inclusion coordinator at Dance NYC, Hannah Jew, and our symposium coordinator was also a dial intern with us, Michaela Ware. Well, that is, that's fabulous, and also there was one here at Gibney, so, you know, I love that. I found my list. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mich Michelle, your thoughts on this topic? Wow, I have so many thoughts on this topic. Um, <laughs> I, I appreciate that you um, you, you write and you do and you are purposefully, you know, trying to make that shift and make that change um, for the organization. Um, but I think the one thing that we really shy away from having conversations about both in dance and in the broader arts community is the systemic oppression of people of color. If, if, that, if the beginnings of the inequities in the arts field um, you know, didn't exist, there would be no need to have programs like this, right? And so the question then becomes for me, having, you know, been appointed to this new organization who doesn't uh, need to draft, doesn't need to do, doesn't need to write because it lives these values. It lives these, organi these organizational values and has for over 42 years. Um, the question for me then becomes, well, you know, when do we, get to sit down and have a real conversation about what is hierarchical arts, about what is seen as value in the arts, right? The, um, the, the map that, that you, sh and I'm, I'm not beating up on you, I'm just, Thank you. I, I'm your colleague and a friend, but the map that you, you showed, and you feel free to push back, but you, you mentioned that that was um, nonprofit and for-profit organizations, and I assume by nonprofit, 501c3 nonprofits? It's not, it's even smaller than that. It's just Dun and Bradstreet number. Mm -hmm. um, so there's many, many, many more organizations than those, but that number is, is bigger than any legislator thinks. So therefore, the whole point of that is not that it represents the arts world, that it represents something that's a piece of the arts world that's bigger than anybody imagines. That's the point. Right, well, and, and so to my point, I think oftentimes we look at the data, we look at the numbers, and it's not representative of who the artists are that are out there doing this work. And that, for me, is very highly problematic. Can I add something to that? Please. Okay, so let's our- have, Let's have the conversation Michelle wants to have. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we can have it now. <laughs> When so, did we have the conversation about dismantling oppression in all its forms? Let's, let's it, do it. It all depends what room you're in. Yeah. And the, what we've been talking about is the room with the legislators, the room with uh, Congress or mayors or whatever. And so you, you talk to them about and what is it you're trying to achieve. You're trying to get them to do something. So you talk about things in that context. If we're talking about human beings, real people, then it's an entirely different conversation about what America's values are and what should be what should be focused on and what should be emphasized. And um, I like to have lots of bits of data that can illustrate different things. So going to artists, for example, if you go to the federal government, um, you know, my, my, my figure there are 700,000 done in Bradstreet, for-profit, 600,000, 100,000 non-profit, um, is smaller than, than the thing. But if you go to artists, okay, artists, the ones that actually claim that they work half time or more um, in the arts, that you know, they're actually working as artists, our government says that's two and a half million people according to tax forms, two and a half million. And think of how many don't work you know, more than half time, which is most of them. It makes that a massive number. So that's what you're talking about, this massive number of underrepresented people. Now, do they benefit from the National Endowment for the Arts, for example, going all the way back to that, most of them not directly, all of them indirectly, because the network of support that's in its infancy, because remember, the country is almost 300 years old, and, pu and public funding for the arts is 50 years old. We're, we're at the beginning of this, and uh, we could lose it like that. So, but the idea of that infrastructure that you could build on have dialogue about, make better. 
Um, it's entirely dependent, in my opinion, after doing this for 40 years, on how much we, as individuals, as artists, um, participate in that process. Thank you. Thank you. Mich Michelle, do you have? No, go ahead. Sorry. I'll, well, I think it's I'll hold. A, it's, <laughs> well, it's, I think it's a nice segue, um, because the, the, the next question that I have for you, I said at the beginning that I wanted us to leave with action items. How can we engage in arts advocacy? And I'm, I'm going to invite you to, to, offer your, <coughs> to offer your recommendations here. But also, Michelle, you've, you've, you've raised this question about when and how to have this conversation about dismantling op oppression and, li mm -hmm. and living um, the work. Uh, maybe there's a way that, that that frame can inform the kind of advocacy that all of us in the room are doing. Sure. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to see the lineup at the symposium today because you are tackling it head on. Um, and until we're really ready to dive into that conversation, um, the numbers and the data and the, you know, all of that really is meaningless. It's meaningless to the artists I work with and the artists that I represent as part of Ultimate Roots. Um, you know, it's, artists will, artists will do their art whether they have the funding or not, right? Because it's who they are. It's, it's ingrained in their DNA. Artists will do their art. But the question is, where do we as a country place the value? And what is a value to us? And it, it saddens me that um, you know, I have to arm my artists with economic numbers to be able to convince their council people that they should be voting something. They should be able to showcase their art and have that tell the story for them. Um, and so that saddens me in some respects. That said, I've been in a room with a congressperson who has watched a dance show who changed, had a change of heart after viewing art on the stage. It was a social justice piece. And it resonated, he said, it resonated with him more than any talking or summary that he would have received in a brochure or a memo. So I would just say to all the artists in the room, don't underestimate the power of your art, and keep yourself informed and aware, and know who the decision makers are in your areas, whether you live in a rural area or a major city. Know who the decision makers are and get in front of them any way that you can. And there are resources that are dance specific to help you on the Dance USA website. Um, and um, you know, utilize those resources. Be a knowledgeable artist and be a strong advocate for your field because if you don't, nobody else will. I can go in and advocate, but you going in and advocating is a much more powerful tool. Thank you, and as a, as a reminder to, to all, Dance NYC works in alliance with Dance USA to engage the local community in Dance USA's national, national efforts. Bob. Key, key actions, how can we move so, forward? I, I would say all, all success is local, to your point. It's all local, it's all small. If it's, if it's on equity, for example, um, we uh, start with your own organization. We have a dialogue, uh, 12 staff discussion sessions, um, one a month, on uh, different kinds of privilege and different kinds of problems. That, that shouldn't just be in the organization, that should be in the community, that should be in the broad arts community and in every community in America. So that's one kind of thing. To the action steps for, um, for the future, I'll, I'll go to the same point. Um, and I'll use Trey McIntyre as an example. Uh, uh, Congressman Mike Simpson uh, was, uh, last time around, the single most important congressman to the arts in America. Anybody ever heard of him? No. Okay, Boy ah, there you go, Boise, Idaho. Uh, so um, Boise, Idaho, because he chaired the committee that um, signed the legislation for the NEA and the NEH and all the other agencies. But Trey McIntyre, as a, as a dancer, got to know him personally, um, embedded himself in the community, got to know the local leaders and the federal leaders, and made him love, made the congressman love dance. Now the congressman still asked me for economic impact numbers. He still asked me for the map. He still asked me for all of that other data. The combination of those two things, passion, which is a, a passion and artistry, which is a personal good, and uh, the idea of um, public benefit, a public good, what's in it for the public, 
in this very practical nation, the United States of America, that question always has to be answered. That combination is our secret to success. Oh, and specific steps. Um, join the Action Fund, it's free. And if you join the Action Fund, you will get memos on every one of the things that we've been talking about here and a specific step to take action in one minute. Most people don't have enough time to do more. That means you push a button and you've advocated. The second thing is we have National Arts Advocacy Day coming up in two weeks. This is the book for it. Um, it uh, trains people for a day and then they go up on the hill for a day. And there are a dozen a national uh, dance organizations, Dance USA, American Dance Therapy Association, many others involved with sponsoring this. So that's the second thing. Um, and, and then I would say uh, your own individual involvement. This is the hardest one, but think about Trey. Advocacy is not a one day a year thing. It's an ongoing building of a dialogue with the people that you want to influence. And if you can do that, become a trusted advisor, we can change everything. Th thank you for that. And I said earlier that I had at least one action that I'd, I'd like to share. Uh, so our city council's cultural affairs uh, uh, committee is hosting a hearing this Wednesday, February 28, 10 a.m. at City Hall on the topic, Art as Resistance State in Trump's America. <laughs> <laughs> Go City Council. Uh, and this hearing follows a rally at City Hall last year and called to Trump to fully fund the cultural agencies. I encourage you to show up, put your artistry forward and your voices forward uh, at the hearing on Wednesday. I also invite you to share your testimony and thoughts and ideas with Dance NYC so that we can compile that, that testimony and, and, and make sure your voices are heard. Uh, I believe that we've passed around index cards to jot down ideas and, and can collect them as you're, you're leaving the room uh, after the session. Uh, and you can also post your ideas on our symposium app or the Facebook Live feed. Again, we want to put your voices forward. And with that, I'd like to segue to a conversation with all of you uh, and invite, um, invite your, your questions at as many as possible. Uh, we have a roving mic. What I'd like to do is to uh, uh, pass it around. Um, uh, please give your name, your affiliation, and keep the question to 30 seconds if possible. Um, uh, please. Uh, and again, for those of you not with us in the room, you can put your questions through the Symposium app. And on the Facebook live feed, and we'll get to some. Thanks. Hi, my name is Simi Linton. I represent an organization called Disability Arts NYC. And to Dance NYC's and Lane's credit, disability is always named in discussions of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in your discourse today, I have not heard that term. And unfortunately, people don't recognize disability um, as an element of inclusion and equity uh, and for disabled artists. I'd like to ask you how you do uh, articulate disability in this conversation and how we as an organization can help you fine tune, if you need it, uh, that uh, discourse. Go ahead. Please. Uh, um, so, uh, it's only time that um, uh, didn't allow me to read the whole statement, the cultural equity statement, but disability is um, uh, definitely in there. And interestingly, we went through a, a, a whole debate with the disability ability community on the use of that term, which was, uh, should it be ability or disability? And so, but that, that's out there. And, and, and so um, we went through that uh, and, and uh, we have, uh, tried programmatically uh, to do all the things that I talked about, particularly um, in programs like, like different kinds of offerings to make things more accessible. Um, but one of the things that is the most involved that we are is that our entire um, military arts and healing work is with returning wounded and disabled 
military with both um, mental uh, uh, challenges and physical challenges and how the arts and dance therapy uh, as well is helping that healing process. So you're absolutely right. It has to constantly be called out, constantly uh, 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 commented on and uh, paid attention to. And that's, in our organization, just a few of the things that we're paying attention to right now on that front. And also my apologies for not addressing it forthright. It is very much a part embedded in the work of Alternate Roots and has been for many years, um, at, as well as Stanch USA. And thank you for raising that. Um, as always, we all are still learning. And so I apologize to you for that. And just know that it is not forgotten in the work that is done in both organizations that I work with. And it is very much highly held up and represented fully and recognized as a form of oppression in, in addition to all the other forms of oppression that are out there. Thank, thank you. And we'll be sure to make connections um, with, with you all and Disability Arts NYC. Um, and to just to call out the it's a celebratory moment here uh, at, Gibney, at Gibney Dance. Uh, last night, uh, there was a virtual groundbreaking on a new elevator in the building, um, which uh, is, is moving on a number of levels. Um, it, it really, it represents a shift from mere compliance uh, as a goal to disability equity. Uh, and we're trying to model that in all aspects of the event today and to, to address disability in an explicit way. So thank you, Simi. Other questions? Yeah, uh, hi. Um, my name, I'm here. I'm, it's hard to see with the, the lights. <laughs> I'm in the dark, yes. Um, my name is Victor Searleson. I'm with the Dancing Crane, Inc. Georgian Cultural Center in Brooklyn. And among other things, we have a really strong Georgian dance ensemble, probably the only professional level one in the country. And I have noticed recently that there's a distinct change in the way the USCIS handles the EB1 Extraordinary Artist Green Corps green card cases, particularly for our dance applicants. And I want to know what we can do about it. Uh, um, there, there has to be a unified discussion on a specific policy changes that people want. So for example, um, the first step of that is to be involved with um, this Arts Advocacy Day process, which includes 80 national service organizations, and it comes to what I think is the most important thing, issue briefs that um, are a dozen things that all of these organizations um, agree to. Visas is one of those areas, and I would invite you to be uh, part of that dialogue or take a look at this after the, the session today and see if it says what is needed to be said about, about visas. So the step one is let's make sure we get the policy the way that um, you need it to be. And my colleagues at um, Association of Performing Arts Professionals and others and the uh, Performing Arts Alliance, they, they spend time on those kinds of issues, but it doesn't mean it's the way you want it. Number one is get the policy right. Then number two, let's make sure that we advocate it to get the changes in the committee that oversees um, uh, visa law. And that can be done, it's just a question of convincing um, that committee that it's that important. Um, and uh, you know, it sometimes, we have more clout on one issue than another issue because we have more involvement on one issue than another issue. So that's the step process to make a change. And assuming that you're asking that question as an artist or an artist presenter, you probably don't have time to do a lot of that stuff, right? I mean, that's always the issue with artists. It's like, that's great, but who has time to do this? We're just trying to make our artistry and make a living and survive day to day. So if that is your situation, then I would encourage you to reach out to Dance USA. Um, Brandon Gride is our director of government affairs. Yeah, we actually share him with Opera America, and he can um, work with you very specifically on visa issues to try to help you and not just like give the information, but really shepherd you through that process. And he is happy to do so. So if you're looking for someone to really sort of hold on to that can walk you through that, um, I highly encourage you to reach out to Brandon at Dance USA. government. The law has not changed. It's a changed on the ground practice by the agents who review the cases. I've seen difference. 
Big difference. Um, um, but um, same process of, of advocating. One, you're trying to advocate for um, a, a law. Uh, two, you're trying to advocate to the people who uh, are in charge for accountability. But um, w once again, in order to get, in order to get that accountability, uh, it's still a chain of, um, of a advocacy to decision makers in charge. More questions? Yes. Please. Hi, my name is Charles Rice Gonzalez. I'm with BAD, the Bronx Academy Hi, Charles. of Arts Hi. and Dance. Hello. <laughs> um, I want to ride the wave of positivity that Michelle was speaking about in terms of the opportunity. And um, also, I want to say that um, as an organization in the Bronx, that we resonate with many of the groups at Alternate Roots as an organization run by people of color, serving primarily people of color. And um, I think what we're having in this room is a discussion about the, what I see that this country is in the midst of a civil war of values. And part of that civil war is like, and those values are about social uh, justice, racism, equity. So that we can acknowledge that that's where we're in, there's a war. And the latest example of systemic oppression is these laws, right, that are, that look, that seek to, uh, the tax laws that seek to hurt us the most. So in terms of the NEA, we're gonna fight because I think at this point that's part of our DNA to fight and advocate. Um, um, and maybe my question to the room, um, to the panel and to the room is about the individual donors. So I've been thinking about that. Um, how do we uh, create messaging or strategies to continue to have our individual donors give? So this room is full of very bright people. Are there any ideas in here and the panel as well? Um, also, um, maybe Dance NYC or other agencies can also um, bring together conversations with other nonprofit organizations that rely on individual funds who are not arts organizations to see what strategies or thoughts are happening in those circles. And lastly, if there's a counterpoint um, in terms of policy to the individual donor giving, that might create incentive. I don't know what it is, but I've been, that's what I've been thinking. So those are three ideas I wanted to ask the panel in the room. Thank you, Char Thank you Charles. Do you all have, do you have thoughts, Bob, Michelle? Um, thank you um, for raising that and agreed. Um, I tend to climb onto the positive because things get so bad sometimes. You, it's, it's really hard. It's really hard to wake up every day as an artist and read the news or see what's going on and feel more and more marginalized and more and more forgotten. Um, and I get that. Uh, that said, um, I do think that um, there are uh, there are ways that we can uh, message, speak to, and hold up um, the work and um, the messiness of it in a way that does inspire our individual donors. I agree. I think convenings, which is you know what Dance NYC is all about. Um, artists to come together to really think about this, to really look at this moment in time and understand the landscape that we're in, um, the messiness that it is, and really come together to brainstorm around how do we, how do we have that conversation and how do we help those individual donors who at this juncture are really sort of holding you all to understand what it means, what it, what it, what historically it means, what it means now, how all this conversation around race and equity is indeed the flavor of the month. But we, as artists of color and and disabled artists and LGBT artists and immigrant artists, have been living this forever, right? It's just everybody's ready to have a conversation about it. And so, um, I think you know, oftentimes we. We feel very alone, and we feel like it's on our shoulders to figure out that. But I would say lean into each other um, to have those conversations and figure out what that messaging is and how to get the support that you need. Thank, thank you, and I, I hope we can all take that invitation and lean in to each other today. I'd like to take one question, if I can, from Facebook Live or uh, the Symposium app. Are there, is there someone to? Give me a question. <laughs> okay, I'll go for the first one. <laughs> I'm 
<laughs> Maybe not the first no. one. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's the, I mean, it's the, it's, the, it's the same question, so maybe, um, maybe you all can deal with this directly, too. How can dance organizations incentivize individual donation given, donations given the tax plan? Is there messaging that would be particularly useful given the current climate? And I, I recognize that we don't know exactly how this will play out, yeah. but as I suggested before, it seems to me that the disincentive to charitable giving is really from those who are most likely to receive the benefits of charitable institutions, that those who receive are disempowered and those who control are given more control. Um, and so how do, we, how do we wrestle with that in the way that we talk about and put forward the work that we, we care so about? So I would just say that that question is more of a fundraising question. How do you incentivize a donor to give to you? as opposed to a policy advocacy position, which is another incentive. Um, and you know, I, I look at fundraising, I look at advocacy, and I look at marketing as all the same. It's essentially the same set of skills in order to do those three things. It's just aimed at three different pots of money, private sector, public sector, earned. Um, but in, in, in the case of the, um, uh, the donor, I think we're in a time where you have to reach out much more on the whole um, value, the, the personal value, the artistic value side of things, stronger than ever right now, because the other incentive might not be there. So reach out earlier, reach out more. That's one thing. On the, on the, on the public sector policy side, it goes to the question that was asked before. Um, you know, we're in a very interesting situation where uh, we are only part of a world, the whole nonprofit world, that cares about this issue. Um, the Council of Foundations, I'm on the Independent Sector Board. Um, there is a, a, a um, charitable giving coalition. We are part of that, but what's very interesting is that th that coalition had difficulty on the tax issue, and they look at our success with the arts, and they want to know how they can do more of this kind of work, the harder political work, and so we're being asked to help them do that. I think there's an opportunity for us in that help to get more people on our arts side and for more arts people to be involved in that broader nonprofit community dialogue because at the end of the day, we have the clout in America. We just don't flex it enough. Yeah, th thank you for that. And you know, I, I would just offer that as a thought, trying to think about the alignment between uh, our fundraising and programming is key, is key for Dance NYC and we don't, encourage and we try not to do fundraising to the side of any of the work that we do. Which is to say it's about thinking about our individual donors as our constituents, which is a challenge for a service organization. But, that, but what that means is how do we consider them uh, as advocates for our work and how can we empower them um, to go out there and, and, and participate in, in the kind of advocacy that we're talking about today. The clock is in the red. But I, but I, but I, 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 I want to give you a final. I want to give you a final word. So, final, final, final thoughts. Final words. Um, yeah. So thank you, Lane. Thank you for hosting this conversation. For continuing to inspire the dance artists in New York and beyond. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to be here. I am happy to be in this conversation. I am hopeful, and I still remain hopeful. And I know that's that's it's a hard place to sit, but. I believe in the power of the arts, and I believe in the power of the arts to change community, and to change people, and to change minds. And so I think if we can hold on to that and not let the negativity bog us down, we will be well served and we will serve our communities. That said, there's still some really important conversations that need to be had in our arts community. Um, and I think until those conversations that are had, the inequities that we see, not only just with the government funding, but funding in general, will continue to be pervasive. And so let's start having those conversations as well. You know, it's fabulous in these times to have two positive people on the panel. <laughs> uh, both of us are optimists, obviously. And what I would just say to everybody here in the room, uh, can you as an artist or can you as an arts organization, a, a dance organization, a dancer, can you make a difference? And what I would say is we forget this, but you know, I once saw a list um, of uh, things, uh, election of Thomas Jefferson, the beheading of Charles I of England, 
and the right of, for women to get the vote in the United States. And what do they have in common, those very disparate things? What they have in common is they all happen by one vote. One vote. Charles I was particularly disappointed about that uh, <laughs> dynamic. Um, but um, the point is that you, as individuals and as organizations, we can make a difference. We can make a big difference. The arts are important. Uh, you are important. You are powerful. And you are not alone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all for being here, and thank you to our panelists for, for your partnership in moving dance and the arts forward. Thank you, thank you, enjoy the day.